This is Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, Chapter 18, Gastrointestinal and Urologic Emergencies. Once you complete this chapter and the related coursework that accompanies it, you will understand the anatomy and physiology of the gastrointestinal, genital urinary, and renal systems. You should be able to assess and manage various patient populations with numerous related gastrointestinal and or gastro or genital urinary complaints. These include, but are not limited to, direct or referred abdominal pain, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, shock related to acute, which is medical versus trauma, or chronic gastrointestinal disorders, hemorrhage, peritonitis, and complications related to the renal system. Abdominal pain is a common complaint. The cause of abdominal pain is often difficult to identify. As an EMT, you do not need to determine the exact cause of the abdominal pain. However, you should be able to recognize life-threatening problems and act swiftly in response. The patient in pain is probably anxious, requiring application of your skills of rapid assessment and emotional support. Let's discuss the anatomy and physiology of the abdominal cavity first. The abdominal cavity contains solid and hollow organs that make up three systems, the gastrointestinal system, genital system, and the urinary system. The solid organs are the liver, spleen, pancreas, and kidneys, and in women, ovaries. Injury to a solid organ can cause shock and bleeding. The hollow organs are the gallbladder, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, urinary bladder. If there is a perforation of these hollow organs, the contents of that hollow organ will leak and contaminate the body cavity. In this slide, you see two images. The image on the left depicts the solid organs that are located within the abdominal cavity or within the vicinity of the abdominal cavity. And the image on the right hand side of the slide shows the hollow organs. We will go into more specifics about the ovaries and the kidneys, but if you're listing the contents of each quadrant, you're not going to include the kidneys because they are in their own space, the retroperitoneal space, and you're not going to include the ovaries because that's only in half the population and any problems associated with the ovaries, uh, which 99% of the time the female patient will know about already, um, that falls in the purview of OBGYN. So we'll touch more on that later. But what they're showing you here is these are all the solid organs and the left and on the right, those are all of the hollow organs. Now with the gastrointestinal system, it is important to understand how it works. The gastrointestinal system is responsible for the digestion process of food. Digestion begins when food is put into the mouth and chewed. Salivary glands secrete saliva and begin to break the food down. The food is then swallowed. Food travels down the esophagus to the stomach. The stomach is the main organ of the digestive system. In it, the gastric juices that are contained in the stomach break down food. The liver assists in digestion. It secretes bile, which aids in the digestion of fats. The liver also filters toxic substances produced by the process of digestion. It creates glucose stores and then also produces 
substances necessary for blood clotting and immune function. The gallbladder is a reservoir for bile. Food then travels from the stomach to the small intestine, which consists of three sections. At the beginning of the small intestine, just past the stomach, is the duodenum. Digestive juices from the pancreas and liver mix together in the duodenum. The pancreas itself secretes enzymes that break down starches, fats, and proteins. And the pancreas also releases amylase. Amylase is responsible for the breaking down of starches into sugar. Biocarbonate is also produced in the pancreas. Bicarbonate neutralizes stomach acids in the duodenum, and insulin is also produced in the pancreas. The pancreas regulates the amount of glucose in the bloodstream. Then another structure in the small intestine is the jejunum. This plays a major role in the absorption of digestive products. It does much of the work in the small intestine. The ileum absorbs nutrients that were not absorbed earlier in the digestive process. It also absorbs bile acids so they can be returned to the liver for future use and vitamin B12 for making nerve cells and red blood cells. The colon is the large intestine. Food that is not broken down in the small intestine and subsequently used then moves into the colon as a waste product. Peristalsis moves that waste matter through the intestines, small and large. Water is absorbed and stool is subsequently formed. It then passes through the rectum to the anus and is defecated outside the body, to the outside of the body. Additional abdominal organs that need to be discussed are the spleen, and the spleen is located in the abdomen but has no digestive function. The spleen is actually part of the lymphatic system. It also plays a significant role in relation to red blood cells and the immune system. It also assists in filtration of blood and aids in the development of red blood cells. The spleen serves as a, red, as a blood reservoir and produces antibodies. The genital system we will discuss now and the abdominal space also holds reproductive organs. The male reproductive system consists of the testicles, the epididymis, vasa differentia, the seminal vesicles, and the prostate gland, and then the penis. The female reproductive system consists of ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, cervix, and vagina. The urinary system controls discharge of certain waste materials filtered from the blood by the kidneys. The kidneys are solid organs. The ureters, bladder, and urethra are hollow organs. There are two kidneys, one on each side of the body. They lie on the posterior muscular wall of the abdomen behind the peritoneum in the retroperitoneal space. This is what I was referring to earlier. The kidneys play an important role in the regulation of acidity and blood pressure, and they rid the body of toxic waste. They also control balance of fluid and electrolytes, and blood flow is very high in the kidneys. The ureters join each kidney to the bladder. There's one ureter per kidney, and they join into the bladder. The ureters are small, hollow, muscular tubes, and the process of peristalsis moves urine to the bladder. The urinary bladder is located immediately behind the pubic symphysis, which is the front side of the bones of the pelvis, where they join in the front. That's the symphysis pubis. The bladder is located right behind that. The bladder empties to the outside of the body through the urethra. In the male, the urethra passes from the anterior base of the bladder through the penis. 
in females, the urethra opens at the front of the vagina, and normal adults, men and women, form one and a half to two liters of urine per day on average. This slide illustrates the male urinary system. Here you can see the kidneys, one on each side, one ureter from each kidney into the bladder. In males, the prostate gland lies just below the bladder. And then if you follow it on down, the urethra comes from the bladder and urine travels through the urethra and is voided outside of the body. Now it's really important that you keep this straight. The ureter is the hollow tube, one from each kidney, that moves urine from the kidneys into the bladder. That's the ureter. The urethra is the tube which urine passes from the bladder through the tube, the urethra, and then to the outside world. So make sure you know the difference and speak carefully uh, between urethra and ureter. Let's discuss pathophysiology, problems that can develop in the abdominal cavity. The abdominal cavity is lined by a membrane called the peritoneum. The peritoneum also covers the organs of the abdomen. The parietal peritoneum lines the walls of the abdominal cavity itself, whereas the visceral peritoneum covers the organs of the abdomen. The presence of foreign material, such as blood, pus, bile, pancreatic juice, and amniotic fluid can irritate the peritoneum, causing peritonitis. Acute abdomen refers to the sudden onset of abdominal pain. It is often associated with severe progressive problems that require medical attention. Peritonitis, or inflammation of the peritoneum, typically causes ileus. Ileus is the paralysis of the muscular contraction, peristalsis, that normally propel material through the intestine. This causes a problem of retention of gas and feces and distends the abdomen. When this is the case, the stomach cannot empty itself by the normal process of digestion, so it can only empty itself by vomiting, which is emesis. Peritonitis is frequently associated with nausea and vomiting. Peritonitis is also associated with loss of bodily fluid into the abdominal cavity. The patient may present with tachycardia and hypotension. Make sure to look for signs of shock. Diverticulitis is an inflammation in small pockets at weak areas in the muscle walls. Fever may be present. And these are the muscle walls of the intestines. That's diverticulitis. Another problem that can occur in the abdomen is cholecystitis, which is inflammation of the gallbladder. There may be a fever present in this patient. Yet another problem that can develop in the abdomen is acute appendicitis. It is important to note that with acute appendicitis, the patient's temperature may still be within normal limits. Regarding abdominal pain itself, there are two different types of nerves that supply the peritoneum. As a result, abdominal pain can have different qualities. The parietal peritoneum is supplied by the same nerves that supply the skin of the abdomen. It can perceive pain, touch, pressure, heat, and cold. The patient can easily identify and localize a point of irritation the visceral peritoneum is supplied by the autonomic nervous system. These nerves are far less able to localize sensation, so the patient will not be able to describe exactly where the pain is. And it's sometimes referred to, or called, referred pain. This slide demonstrates how 
active cholecystitis can cause referred pain to the right shoulder. If you notice at the bottom of the cervical spine and the beginning of the thoracic spine, which is the bottom of the neck and the beginning of the shoulders, there is a synapse point. And at this point, there are nerves that branch off into the right arm. If you travel farther down, when you get to the very bottom of the thoracic spine, uh, near the bottom, you come to another synapse point. And that's the nerve that um, is responsible for sending and receiving signals um, for the gallbladder. So many times, patients who have cholecystitis will often say that they have severe right shoulder pain. And sometimes they may have that right shoulder pain in lieu of pain in the area of the gallbladder itself. More often than not, they can easily identify that the pain is in the area of the gallbladder. They'll point to it. However, they may also complain of severe right shoulder pain. So bear that in mind when you're doing your assessment of the patient and gathering history from them as to when this came about and how it presents itself. Ulcers are a common cause of acute abdomen pain or abdominal pain. Ulcers form when the protective layer of mucus inside the stomach erodes and this allows the stomach acids to eat into the organ or the stomach itself. Now that's a peptic ulcer. And that's an ulcer that occurs in the stomach itself. And the causes of peptic ulcers are the Helicobacter pylori infection. And this is a bacteria um, that can cause peptic ulcers. And another way that ulcers are brought about is chronic use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. In addition, alcohol and smoking can contribute to a peptic ulcer as well. If the erosion is severe, it can lead to gastric bleeding. Peptic ulcers affect men and women equally, but do occur more frequently in the geriatric population. And it is usually described as burning, gnawing pain in the stomach that subsides or diminishes immediately after eating. Nausea, vomiting, belching, and heartburn are common symptoms. Some ulcers heal without intervention. Gallstones are a major problem in the abdomen and a common one. The gallbladder itself is a storage pouch for digestive juices and waste from the liver. Gallstones may form and if the blockage does not pass, it can lead to severe inflammation of the gallbladder called cholecystitis. The phenomenon of cholecystitis is a result of a condition that causes the wall of the gallbladder to become inflamed. The gallbladder can rupture in severe cases. And cholecystitis presents as a constant severe pain in the right upper or mid-abdominal region and may refer to the right upper back, flank, or shoulder area. Symptoms may appear 30 minutes after a fatty meal and at night. The symptoms include nausea, vomiting, indigestion, bloating, gas, and belching. People at higher risk for devel developing cholecystitis include women, older adults, obese people, and people of Scandinavian, Native American, and Hispanic descent. Pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas. It is caused by an obstructing gallstone, alcohol abuse, or other diseases. Signs and symptoms include severe pain in the upper left and right quadrants, and it often radiates to the back. The patient may report that the pain is worse after eating. And the symptoms that appear are typically nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, tenderness, and sepsis or hemorrhage may occur. So look for fever and tachycardia. 
Appendicitis is an inflammation or infection of the appendix and can cause tissues to die, causing an abscess, peritonitis, or shock. The pain is initially more generalized, dull, and diffuse and may center in the area of the umbilical area. Pain later localizes to the right lower quadrant as it escalates. Signs and symptoms are nausea and vomiting, anorexia, fever, chills, and rebound tenderness. Rebound tenderness is the result of peritoneal irritation, and it is assessed by pressing down gently and firmly on the abdomen. When the MT releases their hand, the patient will immediately feel pain when that pressure is released. In addition to all the other things that we described as problems that can develop in the abdominal cavity, another of these problems is gastrointestinal hemorrhage. This is bleeding within the gastrointestinal tract and it can be acute. It may be shorter term and more severe when it is acute, but it can also be chronic. And when it's chronic, it may be longer in duration and less severe. However, all complaints should be considered serious. It can occur in the upper or lower gastrointestinal tract. Bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract occurs from the esophagus to the upper small intestine. Hematemesis is frequently seen in patients with upper gastrointestinal bleeding. Basically, that means they're throwing up blood and it may be red fresh blood or it may look like coffee grounds but either way that is hematemesis. Lower gastrointestinal bleeding occurs between the upper part of the small intestine and the anus. It often manifests as melina or dark tarry stools. Esophagitis is the lining of the esophagus becoming inflamed either by infection or from acids in the stomach. Acids for the stomach can occur because the patient might suffer from GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease. And with this condition, the sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach opens, which allows stomach acid to move up into the esophagus. It is also referred to as acid reflux disease, and it can cause a burning sensation within the chest, which is heartburn. The patient may report pain when they swallow, and some additional symptoms are, as we already mentioned, heartburn, but you can also have nausea, vomiting, sores in the mouth, and that is acid reflux or GERD. There's also esophageal varices. Esophageal varice occurs when the amount of pressure within the blood vessels surrounding the esophagus increase. When the blood flow is blocked in the portal vessels, vessels dilate, causing the capillary network of the esophagus to begin leaking. If that pressure continues to build, the vessel walls may fail causing massive upper gastrointestinal bleeding and hematemesis. Initially, the patient shows signs of liver disease, fatigue, weight loss, jaundice, anorexia, edema in the abdomen, and abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. It is a gradual disease process, and it can actually take years before the patient feels discomfort. Rupture of varices is far more sudden. This occurs with sudden onset of discomfort in the throat, severe difficulty swallowing, vomiting bright red blood, hypotension, and signs of shock. Mallory Weiss syndrome is what we're going to talk about now. In the junction between the esophagus and the stomach, that can tear. When it tears, it causes severe bleeding and possibly death. Their primary risk factors are alcoholism, eating disorders. Now, it is prevalent in older adults and older children, and vomiting is the principal symptom. In extreme cases, 
Patients may experience signs and symptoms of shock, upper abdominal pain, hem hematemesis, and melena. Melena, excuse me. Gastroenteritis is a different problem, and gastroenteritis is an infection combined with diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. It can be caused by either bacteria or viral organisms and enters the body through contaminated food or water. It can also be caused by non-infectious conditions such as adverse medication reactions, toxin exposure, or chemotherapy. Diarrhea is the principal symptom in both types. These signs and symptoms are large dumping style or dumping type diarrhea or frequent small liquid stools. The diarrhea can contain blood or pus. There is abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, fever, and anorexia. Diverticulitis is an abdominal problem and it was first recognized around 1900 when the amount of processed foods that were eaten increased. The consistency of stools became more solid, requiring more intestinal contractions, resulting in increasing pressure in the colon. Bulges in the colonic walls result from increased intestinal contractions. Fecal matter is caught in the bulges and bacteria gather there, causing inflammation and infection. The main symptom is abdominal pain on the left side, lower abdomen, and the signs are fever, malaise, body aches, chills, nausea, and vomiting. Hemorrhoids are an abdominal problem that occur when swelling and inflammation of blood vessels surrounding the rectum produce hemorrhoids and these may result from conditions that increase pressure on the rectum or irritation of the rectum. Increased pressure may be caused by pregnancy, straining at stool, in other words straining when you're when a patient is on the toilet, and chronic constipation. Diarrhea can also cause irritation that results in hemorrhoids. They present as bright red blood during defecation, but it is usually minimal bleeding and it is easy to control. Patient, patients may also experience itching and a small mass on the rectum. Problems that can develop in the urinary system is what we're going to talk about now. The first is cystitis, which is a bladder infection, and that is actually the bladder itself. Uh, and that is pretty common, especially in women. It can also be called a urinary tract infection uh, because actually the infection can also be in the urethra um, and sometimes it's backed up a little bit into the ureters. And the urinary tract infection is caused by a bacterial infection and the patients usually have lower quadrant abdominal pain. It's not right or left, it's centered in the lower center abdomen. They may report an urgency and frequency in urination. It can become a serious problem if the infection spreads to the urethra and then up to the kidneys. The kidneys play a major role in maintaining homeostasis. The kidneys eliminate waste from the blood and when kidneys fail, uremia results. The waste product, urea, remains in the blood. Then you can have kidney stones that occur, and kidney stones can grow over time and cause blockage. The stones are made up of crystallized chemicals in the urine, and the blockage can lead to swelling. The pain is caused by the stone moving within the ureter. A stone may pass on its own or may have to be surgically removed. Acute kidney failure occurs when there is a sudden decrease in function uh, and can occur from hemorrhage, dehydration, trauma, shock, sepsis, heart failure, medications, drug abuse, and kidney stones. It is reversible with prompt diagnosis and treatment. Chronic kidney failure 
however, is irreversible. It is progressive and develops over months and years. It is often caused by diabetes and hypertension. The kidney tissue shrinks and function diminishes. Eventually, dialysis or transplant is required to remove waste from the blood system. Bloodstream, excuse me. Symptoms are altered level of consciousness, seizure, coma, lethargy, nausea, headache, cramps, and edema in the extremities and face. Now let's talk about the gynecological problems or gynecologic problems that are a common cause of acute abdominal pain. Lower quadrant pain may relate to the ovaries, fallopian tubes, or uterus. In terms of other organ systems, the aorta lies immediately behind the peritoneum. Weak areas in the aorta can result in abdominal aortic aneurysm, also known as triple A. Triple A is difficult to detect. Use extreme caution when trying to assess or detect a triple A. Development of an aneurysm is slow. If the aneurysm tears or ruptures, massive hemorrhage may occur. Pain may be described as a tearing sensation. Handle the patient gently during assessment and transport. Pneumonia, especially in the lower lungs, can cause ileus and abdominal pain. A hernia is a protrusion of an organ or tissue through a hole or opening into a body cavity where it does not belong. Hernias can occur as a result of the following. A congenital defect, such as around the umbilicus, a surgical wound that has failed to heal properly, or a natural weakness in an area such as the groin. Hernias may not always produce a noticeable mass or lump. Reducible hernias pose little risk and can be pushed back into the body cavity. Incarcerated hernias cannot be pushed back in and are compressed by the surrounding body tissue. Strangulation of an incarcerated hernia is a serious medical emergency. Blood supply is compromised by the compressed surrounding tissue. Serious hernia signs and symptoms are as follows. A formerly reducible mass that is no longer reducible pain at the hernia site, tenderness when the hernia is palpated, red or blue skin coloration over the hernia. In terms of patient assessment, you must of course do a proper scene size up, make sure that you have scene safety, and then follow the standard for care precautions. And in that, follow the standard precautions for protection with a minimum of gloves and eye protection. Consider donning a gown and covering your shoes with disposable protective covers. Determine the number of patients. Consider the need for additional or specialized medical resources and request them, say, request them early. Mechanism of injury or nature of illness. Acute abdomen can be the result of violence, such as blunt or penetrating trauma. So always be vigilant. Chapter 30 will concentrate on abdominal and genitourinary injuries, and it discusses abdominal traumatic injuries. A pale or sweating patient who reports tearing pain may have a AAA. Gastrointestinal bleeding often has a characteristic color. In the primary assessment, the first priority is to identify and treat life-threatening conditions. Assess the patient's level of consciousness and ABCs. Rapidly observe the patient and the environment. The patient will often have knees drawn up to, the knee, up to the chest to ease the pain of an acute abdomen. Consider necessary treatment and transport options. Form a general impression. Ask the patient 
about the chief complaint if the chief complaint indicates a life-threatening problem assess and treat it immediately airway and breathing abdominal pain may cause shallow inadequate respirations in terms of circulation ask the patient about blood in vomit or black tarry stools pulse rate quality and skin condition may indicate shock so check pulses in both arms a difference in pulse strength between the two arms may indicate an aortic dissection shock may be caused by hypovolemia or be the result of severe infection if shock is present interventions should include high flow oxygen placing the patient in a supine position keeping the patient warm and in relation to transport you want to transport immediately if signs of significant illness are present pale cool or diaphoretic skin is another indicator for immediate transport and it, in that you also might notice tachycardia hypotension and an altered level of consciousness ensure that the ride is gentle smooth and steady in terms of history taking obtain a sample history addressing the following areas nausea and vomiting changes in bowel habits urination weight loss belching or flatulence pain or other signs or symptoms you also might have concurrent chest pain this is a slide that indicates the physical examination a normal abdomen is soft and tender pain and tenderness signs of acute abdomen indicate that there is some kind of trauma going on inside the abdomen so expose and assess the abdomen and palpate gently make sure to check respiratory rate and pulse rate regularly keep on top of your vital signs with reassessment frequent reassessment is important because it is often difficult to determine the cause of abdominal pain although you cannot treat the causes of acute abdomen you can take steps to provide comfort and lessen the effects of shock treat the patient for shock even when obvious signs of shock are not present position the patient who is vomiting to maintain an airway a patent airway contain the vomitus to prevent spread of infection such as use of a biohazard bag wear gloves eye protection a gown and a mask when the patient has been released to hospital staff clean the ambulance and the equipment wash your hands even though you were wearing gloves providing low flow oxygen may decrease nausea and anxiety In patients with end-stage renal disease or chronic renal failure, dialysis is the only definitive treatment. Dialysis filters the blood, cleanses it of toxins, and returns it to the body. Dialysis eliminates waste, normalizes blood chemistry, and reduces excess fluid. If a patient misses a dialysis treatment, weakness and pulmonary edema can be the first in a series of conditions that be can become progressively more serious some services transport patients to and from dialysis a dialysis machine functions much like a normal kidney does patients undergoing long-term hemodialysis have a shunt that connects a vein and an artery allowing blood flow from the body 
do the dialysis machine. Peritoneal dialysis allows large amounts of dialysis fluid to be infused into and back out of the abdominal cavity. Fluid stays in the cavity for one to two hours. It carries, however, a high risk of peritonitis. Adverse effects of dialysis are hypotension, muscle cramps, nausea and vomiting, hemorrhage from the access site, infection at the access site. If your call involves a patient on dialysis, start with the ABCs. Provide high flow oxygen if indicated. Manage any bleeding from the access site and position the patient sitting up in case of pulmonary edema or supine if the patient is in shock. Transport promptly. Some dialysis patients also have urinary catheters. Catheters can often be a site of infection. Class, thank you for your attention, and now we will move on to the review questions. Question 1. The blank lies in the retroperitoneal space. I covered this pretty extensively, so you should get this one right. The answer is B. The pancreas, kidneys, and ovaries lie in the retroperitoneal space, which is behind the peritoneum, and are often the cause of acute abdominal pain. The liver stomach and small intestine are all found within the true or anterior abdomen. The blank lies in the retroperitoneal space, a liver. That's incorrect because the liver is actually found in the anterior space. B pancreas, that is the correct answer. C the stomach, the stomach is actually found in the interior abdomen. The small intestine is incorrect because the small intestine is found in the anterior abdomen as well as the stomach. Which of the following is not a solid organ? Liver, kidney, spleen, and gallbladder. And you think about the which ways each of this these uh, organs function, you'll get it right easily. And it is D. The gallbladder is a hollow organ that concentrates and stores bile, which is produced by the liver. Other hollow organs include the stomach and the intestines. The liver, spleen, and kidney are all solid organs. Which of the following is not a solid organ? A, liver, and it of course is a solid organ. B, kidney, it is also a solid organ. The spleen is most definitely a solid organ. And out of the choices you were given, gallbladder is the correct answer. It is a hollow organ. Number three, a 34-year-old woman with a recent history of pelvic inflammatory disease presents with an acute severe abdominal pain. Her abdomen um, is descended and diffusely tender to palpation. Based on your findings, you must discover that the, a, the woman has might not be a good idea to keep this in your ambulance either, but the woman has uh, acute severe abdominal pain and based on these findings, which is tender to palpation, you should suspect A, peritonitis, B, pancreatitis, C, append appendicitis, and D, cholecystitis. Peritonitis is an inflammation of the thin membrane that lines the abdominal cavity and typically presents with acute abdominal pain. Causes of peritonitis include infection and blunt or penetrating abdominal trauma. 
The pain caused by peritonitis is typically diffuse or widespread. Appendicitis, however, and pancreatitis and cholecystitis typically present with a pain that is localized to a particular area. Let's look at the incorrect answer. A 34-year-old woman with a recent history of pelvic inflammatory disease presents with acute severe abdominal pain. Her abdomen is distended and diffusely tender to palpation. Based on your findings thus far, you should suspect A, peritonitis, which is obviously the correct answer. B, pancreatitis. Pancreatitis is usually located to a pain in a specific area. Let's review the answers. A 34-year-old woman with a recent history of pelvic inflammatory disease presents with acute severe abdominal pain. Her abdomen is distended and diffusely tendered palpation. Based on her findings thus far, you should suspect appendicitis. That is wrong because appendicitis is localized pain in one specific area. And cholecystitis is also incorrect because it is a localized pain in one specific area as well. Most patients with an acute abdomen present with dyspnea, diarrhea, hypotension, and tachycardia. So which of these findings is uh, present in most cases with acute abdomen? The answer is D, tachycardia, which is a heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute. It is commonly seen in patients with acute abdomen and is usually the result of severe pain. Hypotension is not seen in all patients with an acute abdomen. If the patient is hypotensive, you should suspect internal bleeding or severe infection or sepsis. Many patients with an acute abdomen have increased respirations or tachmia. However, dyspnea, which is a feeling of shortness of breath, is not common. Number four, uh, let's review the incorrect answers. Most patients with an acute abdomen present with dyspnea. While some patients may have increased respirations, they typically do not have difficulty breathing. So dyspnea is incorrect. Diarrhea. Diarrhea may a symptom, be a symptom of some abdominal problems, but not in most patients. Hypotension. Hypotension is not seen in most patients and shock should be suspected when hypotension is present. Tachycardia is the correct answer. Number five, which of the following signs or symptoms would you least likely, would you be least likely to find in a patient with acute abdomen? A, rapid shallow breathing, B, soft, non-distended abdomen, C, tachycardia and restlessness, or D, constipation or diarrhea. Think about this one just a little bit and you'll get it. The correct answer is B. Signs and symptoms of an acute abdomen include, but are not limited to, rapid and shallow breathing, a tense and distended abdomen, tachycardia, a tenselessness or restlessness, excuse me, and constipation or diarrhea. Let's look at the answers that are incorrect. Which of the following signs or symptoms would you be least likely to find in a patient with acute abdomen? A, rapid shallow breathing. This is a common sign of an acute abdomen, um, but is not the most correct answer here. B, a soft, non-distended abdomen, and that is the correct answer. Which of the following signs or symptoms would you least be likely to find in a patient with acute abdomen, tachycardia, and restlessness? And these are common signs of an acute abdomen. 
or constipation and diarrhea. These are common signs of an acute abdomen. Number six, a condition in which a person experiences a loss of appetite is called A. ileus, B. colic, C. emesis, or D. anorexia. The correct answer is D. Anorexia is defined as a loss of appetite. It is a nonspecific symptom, but is often associated with gastrointestinal diseases and abdominal pain. Ileus is the paralysis of the muscular contractions that normally propel material through the intestine. Colic is a severe intermittent cramping pain. Emesis is the proper medical term for vomiting. A condition in which a person experiences a loss of appetite is called A. Ileus. That's incorrect because Ileus is the paralysis of the muscular contractions that normally propel material through the intestine. B. Colic. That's incorrect because colon is the severe intermittent cramping pain. A condition in which a person experiences a loss of appetite is called emesis, which is incorrect because emesis is known as vomiting, and D, anorexia, which is also um, actually the correct answer. Number seven, the review question is, the medical term for inflammation of the urinary bladder is A, cystitis, B, nephritis, C is cholecystitis, and D is diverticulitis. And the answer, of course, is A. Cystitis is the medical term for inflammation of the urinary bladder. Nephritis is the inflammation of the kidney. Cholecystitis is inflammation of the gallbladder. And diverticulitis is a condition in which the small pouches of the colon or the large intestine become inflamed. You know, since we defined all of the other terms, cystitis, which obviously is the correct answer, and nephritis, I'm not going to review them here again. And we also reviewed cholecystitis and diverticulitis, so it would redund be redundant for me the, to repeat them again here. So let's move on to number eight. If a hernia is incarcerated and the contents are so greatly compromised that the circulation is compromised, the hernia is said to be A. Reducible, B. Ruptured, C. Strangulated, or D. Congenital. The answer is C. A strangulated hernia occurs when a hernia is incarcerated and compressed by surrounding tissues. It is a serious medical emergency and requires immediate surgery to repair the hernia, remove dead tissue, and return oxygen to the tissues. When the mass can be placed back into the body, it is considered reducible. Hernias are not at all are not all at the risk of rupturing. A congenital hernia is one that is present as birth and is usually present around the umbilicus. Number eight. If a hernia is incarcerated and the contents are so greatly compressed the circulation is compromised, the hernia is said to be and let's go over these incorrect answers. A, reduced. This is a mass or lump that will disappear back into the body cavity in which it belongs. 
be ruptured. This is a mass or lump that bursts from internal pressure. To finish reviewing number eight, if a hernia is incarcerated and the contents are so greatly compressed that the circulation is compromised, the hernia is said to be C, strangulated, which is the correct answer, and D, hypoxemic. This is incorrect because this actually is the decrease in arterial oxygen levels. A 70-year-old man presents with an acute onset of severe tearing abdominal pain that radiates to his back. His BP is 88 over 66 millimeters of mercury. Pulse rate is 120 beats per minute and respirations are 26 breaths per minute. Treatment for this patient should include A, rapid transport to the hospital, B, firm palpitation of the abdomen, C, placing him in a sitting position, or D, oxygen at 4 liters per minute via nasal cannula. The answer is A, severe tearing or abdominal pain that radiates to the back is typical of an, a, an abdominal aortic aneurysm or AAA. It is commonly uh, occurs in older patients, especially those with hypertension. Treatment includes high flow oxygen and rapid transport. If the patient does uh, have oxygen until help arrives. A 70 year old man presents with an acute onset of severe tearing abdominal pain that radiates to his back. His blood pressure is 88 over 66 millimeters of mercury. Pulse rate is 120 beats per minute and his respirations are 26 breaths per minute. Treatment for this patient should include a rapid transport to the hospital and that is the correct answer b firm palpitation of the abdomen a firm or vigorous palpation is contraindicated in patients with severe or sudden onset abdominal pain so that one's incorrect placing him in a sitting position hypotension is treated by elevating the patient's legs into the shock position that is not called for in this particular case. And D, oxygen at 4 liters per minute via nasal, nasal cannula uh, is incorrect because for a patient in this condition, the recommendation is high flow oxygen uh, because of the treatment of shock. Question 10. In which position do most patients with acute abdominal pain prefer to be transported? A. Sitting with their head elevated 45 degrees. B. Supine with their legs elevated 12 degrees. C. On their side with their knees flexed. Or D. Fowler's position with their knees flexed. The correct answer is C. Most patients with acute abdominal pain prefer to lie on their side with their knees flexed and usually drawn up into their abdomen. This position takes pressure off the abdominal muscles and may afford them pain relief. The other positions do not afford or allow the pressure to be relieved and may cause further discomfort. So let's look at these other incorrect answers. In which position do most patients with acute abdominal pain prefer to be transported? A. Sitting with their head elevated 45 degrees. This is also known as the semi Fowler's position. B. Supine with their legs elevated 12 inches. And this position will not relieve pressure from the abdomen itself. C, on their side with their knees flexed. This is the correct answer. And invariably, unconsciously, they will draw themselves into this position already. And D, Fowler's position with their legs straight. 
this is when the patient is sitting straight up and is most often not the most comfortable position for them to be in. Okay, class, thank you so much for your attention, and we will see you next class. If you have any questions or specifics you need to go over with your instructor, please do so as soon as is possible so that you're absolutely clear. And again, thank you, and we'll see you next class.